Come with us as we explore the captivating story of one of the most successful and unique bands in history. Rocked by the turbulence of heartache, their journey to superstardom is rife with sorrow, surprise and admiration for a band that has changed its lineup over 14 times. If you weren't around at the time, it's hard to convey just how big Fleetwood Mac were in the late 60s. Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac, as they were known, were the kind of most credible and best band in the country. There's no question of that, really. I've never seen a band like that, and it will never be again. You don't have a band have a number one song when they're one, two, three, four, five, ten records in. I mean, it's just unheard of for that to happen, especially now, like to have that kind of staying power. And really, when I mean staying power, the band itself, you know, it's an ever changing cast of characters. For them to be like, we're still gonna keep going on trying to make this work, I just, it's amazing and shocking to even think about. And to think how they persevered through all. Fleetwood Mac began in 1967. John Mayall's Blues Breakers was the foundation, where Mick Fleetwood, John McVie, and Peter Green had all been members. The nucleus of Fleetwood Mac basically takes shape in John Mayall's Blues Breakers. Um, Mick Fleetwood and John McVie were the rhythm section for a while, and on the Hard Road album, they were joined by Peter Green. And he replaced Eric Clapton, which was big shoes to fit into, but he acquitted himself pretty well right from the start. In July 67, they start, you know, looking at doing something themselves, really. And I think it's all, this was motivated by Mick Fleetwood. He named the band Fleetwood Mac to convince other people to come and join the band. He basically named it after them and go, okay, if I name it you, will you, will you join? And they, and they agreed to. So that's how, how Fleetwood Mac started. And they started as purely a very bluesy based band which you can kind of see from where Peter Green started with that band that Eric Clapton was part of. Like, you see his lineage and you know, that kind of makes sense as why it was really bluesy at the start. It was Peter Green who just played this beautiful guitar. And, and I'm not necessarily a big guitar freak, you know what I mean? I'm not a guitar head. But, you know, he played this, you know, he played his Gibson, there's Paul's, and he was absolutely fantastic. He also looked great as well. Yeah, you know, he could look kind of gorgeous, you know, you could see that women would really go for him, you know? Peter can st stand there and, and be quite beautific in the way he's, you know, playing. It's, there's something effortless about the way Green stood there on stage. There's that, and there's that sort of slight shy smile occasionally as well that he gives, you know, when he's playing. It's like, this is all too easy to me. Maybe it was, actually. And I saw a photograph of them in Municipal Express in 1968 when their first album came out. And it showed them standing in a back alley by some dustbins, uh, the same bins, in fact, that appear on that first album. And they looked exactly like you would expect an underground blues group to look like in 1968, um, scruffy and unkempt, but very self-assured. There's something about that photo where, you know, they're not looning about, they're not trying to be 1967 zany. They look very assured, they're very, very purposeful and focused, which is exactly, I think, what that original band was, you know. They knew what they were going to do.
emotional as a player. and very homespun about Fleetwood Mac in those early days. And as I say, it all boils down to, you know, my mate Colin coming into class one Tuesday morning and saying, Albatross is coming to the charts at number 28. And me going, no, nah, you know, records like Albatross don't come in at number 28. You've got this idea that the underground's here and the mainstream's there. And this is our little world of underground music. And John Peel plays it on a Sunday afternoon. And, you know, nobody else much on Radio 1 touches it, you know. But they broke through all of that. They broke through all of those barriers without compromising their integrity. Their first distinctive change in style occurred at the end of 1968, after the release of their second album, Mr. Wonderful, as Danny Kerwin joined the blues quartet. The interesting thing about the band, I think, early on, is that they did have three guitarists, initially two guitarists, Peter Green and Jeremy Spencer. And Jeremy, although he was adequate and he could do a you know, decent line in Elmore James riffs, um, I don't think he was much more than you know, a perfunctory sort of player. And he had his little rock and roll tendencies as well. He likes to sort of muck about and do rock and roll medalists and things. But I think in order to give the band a bit more gravitas, um, Pete brought in Danny Kerwin. And Danny Kerwin added a whole other layer of sensitivity to the unit. I mean, now you've got three guitarists in the band, although funnily enough, they very rarely all play together on the records. There's usually just two of them. But the interplay between Peter and Danny, I think after a while is what makes that band. It, it takes a quantum leap and there's much more kind of, well, there's a lot of fluidity between, between um, Peter Green and Danny Kerwin, you know, it's almost they're doing this of the twin, you know, lead breaks uh, and they're both using the, you know, the Les Pauls. The young 18-year-old guitarist contributed heavily to the band's first single release, Albatross. Um, Green's very sensitive on that song, you know, and he's, he, it's very primal. I mean, he sings at one point, you know, I wish I'd never been born. And 
you don't find bl blues singers at that time or underground blues rock bands sing with a kind of certain swagger. You know, the, those bands are full of well-bred home counties boys all singing about, you know, being your backdoor man and they're taking all their kind of, you know, ideas about how to go about that from Muddy Waters records. And here's Peter Green comes along and sings, um, you know, I'm not a good man, but I would be if I could. I mean, that seems to be an extraordinarily vulnerable thing to be singing on a hit single at that time. Um, Green later said, that I'm, I, he said in a very self-effacing way, I was just singing the Jewish blues. But in many ways, I think that's right. That's what he was doing. You know, this, this Bethnal Green Jewish boy, you know, singing the blues. Frontman Peter Green had been a vital member of the band, crafting many of the hits that Fleetwood Mac had. In 1970, while the band was on tour in Germany, Peter Green attended a party and took an exorbitant amount of LSD. You don't automatically peg Fleetwood Mac as being a psychedelic group. That was something else altogether, you know, that was Pink Floyd and the crazy world of Arthur Brown and the pretty things and all the stuff that was going, to, going on down at UFO Club. There's nothing particularly psychedelic on the records. They don't use phase and effects. They don't use, they don't really use fuzz guitars. There's no stereo panning. They don't all stand on their album covers bedecked in caftans like a lot of people did, you know. Even the Hollies did that for a while, you know. Fleetwood Mac didn't. The idea of LSD being something that's going to be dangerous is not something that I think people thought of. It was thought of a way to free your mind, to be more artistic, as a way to really create the most amazing boundary-pushing art. It's really um, a cautionary tale to other people. And I think as an artist, you really are, I wouldn't say you're um, encouraged necessarily, but part of the mythology of being an artist is to not just push yourself to the edges of what your creativity can be, but also to indulge in whatever's gonna, ha gonna help you attain that. So regardless of the danger, so you have that attitude, the fact that they don't, you know, I don't think LSD was seen as being as, as dangerous as it was, and the whole counterculture movement coming together, this perfect kind of crystallizes this situation for someone like Peter Green, unfortunately, to be a casualty. By 1970, you know, when he is starting to wear the the big white kind of wrap around and everything, and the beard is growing, you know, it's starting to get strange. There is a story of someone bumping into Peter, I think, and he got um, a piece of toast in his beard and he bumps into him a couple of days later and the piece of toast is still there. That doesn't bode well, you know, there's similar stories about any acid casualty at that time where you start to think, no, this is, um, this is not really going in a healthy direction, is it? I've gone through a lot of different, as they say, changes in uh, the old cranium. Emotionally, he wasn't up to and didn't want to continue being involved with any sort of commitment at all, whether it be music uh, or people. And he just withdrew, quite literally. He stayed at home for the better part of three years and hardly ever went out, actually. Losing sense of reality, Green wanted to give away all of the band's earnings forcing his exit in May that same year to follow his ascetic religious belief. Could the band continue without their frontman? In came Christine McVie, John's wife, to fill in the gap. I think Christine McVie in a lot of ways is the unsung hero of Fleetwood Mac because she's not as flamboyant as let's say Mick Fleetwood. She's not Lindsay and Stevie. And when she joins the band, she definitely brings, I mean, not just her own voice, which is, I think, very unique in terms of the writing and in terms of vocalization. But let's just face it, the, a feminine touch to the whole thing. And I think without her being that glue, they would not have continued to the point where they could have gotten Lindsay and uh, Stevie involved in it. And also, would Stevie have been able to survive later on if she'd not had a friend, really, that she could, you know, if it would have been an all-boys club? It's very hard being on the road of all men. When you actually talk to the critics about what she brought to the band, she was fundamentally behind some of their biggest hits that they go on to create. Like, if you look into like in their greatest hits albums, like her tunes are there throughout, and it's her sound that it does go on to be super iconic, and for a while is the Fleetwood Mac sound. So yeah, she was like fundamentally there. 
The songs that are more low key, they're not so straight ahead pop in a lot of ways, are Christine McVie songs and I love them. Like they're just as beautiful. And because she didn't create that whole witchy woman figure like Stevie did, I think she's sometimes kind of forgotten a little bit. In retrospect, you look back, you couldn't see that at the time, but when you look back from rumors to that, you think, oh yeah, there it is. It's, it's that later thing is developing there already with her. You know, she just needs these others to be around her. The band's first album release since the change in the lineup came in 1970 with Kiln House. Kerwin's songs moved the band in the direction of 1970s rock, while Jeremy Spencer recreated the country-tinged sounds of the late 1950s. Coupled with the inclusion of Christine McVie, the band's sound moved towards a more melodic rock. But 1971 brought more turmoil. As the band were on tour again, Spencer mentioned he was going out to, quote, get a magazine, unquote, but he never returned. You know, one of the things that Lindsey Buckingham said is that there's like a curse basically on the guitarist in Fleetwood Mac. It's the front men who have ended up being the casualties, you know, throughout. I mean, Peter goes off on his trip in more ways than one. He wants to give away all his money. He doesn't want to be part of a blues boogie outfit. Um, Jeremy, on tour in America one day, goes out supposedly for a newspaper and doesn't come back uh, and joins the children of God. The band's in Los Angeles. They're doing a gig. It's 1971. He'd been doing a lot of LSD as well. And he goes off to buy a magazine. And the band's waiting for him, waiting for him, waiting for him to come back. Never comes back. Finally, after quite a long period of time, they, fe they find out that he'd been inducted into the, the Children of God cult, which has sex, it has sex with their converts. And, you know, it just is another example of a drug casualty that I think we don't really talk about that much. And at the time, that was seen as quite shocking, and it was presented as such in, in the pop mags, you know. This guy just walks out of the band and nobody knows where he is. And he's with this strange cult, the Children of God, that nobody had really heard of until Jeremy Spencer joined them, even though cults were prevalent in California at the time. And in fact, you probably couldn't walk down certain streets, particularly, hey, Ashbury, without bumping into someone trying to sort of, you know, sell you a cult, you know. Um, and so I think at the time it was, it was actually seen a bit sort of like he, he's another one who's gone tonto. 1972 marked another transformation of Fleetwood Mac. Kerwin had begun to develop a serious alcohol dependency, leading to outbursts on stage. Danny Kerwin was a big drinker and that was, I think, part of his demise. And psychologically, he wasn't cut out for it. There's quite obviously this jinx on guitarist in the early Fleetwood Mac, quite obviously. When their three main men all end up sort of falling by the wayside for different reasons. And with Danny, by all accounts, I mean, he started drinking very heavily. He started drinking heavily before going on stage, which is never a good combination. And there's stories of him, you know, smashing up his stuff backstage. And I think in the end, Mick and John had to be pragmatic. They had no choice but to actually boot him out of the band. It sounds a terrible thing from afar, from a distance, to say, well, how could they do that to him? You know, And there's no safety net in rock and roll bands. You fall down, you fall out, you're gone, you know? There's no social services you can go to to get rehabilitated. And I think it hit Danny Kerwin hard. He never really recovered. The night he's basically fired from the group, he's completely drunk. He smashes his Les Paul to pieces in the dressing room. I think he then smashed his own head against the doors or walls or whatever. And was clearly in a bad, but he's in a bad state. No one understands that really. No one's going to give you the benefit of the doubt at that age. It's on to the next gig, you know, which is a pity. After a confusing period for the band and the announcement of Welch's departure, Fleetwood Mac was once again in search of a focal point, a guitarist with charisma. Stevie was one very much involved with, with Lindsay as a person and as a creative uh, duo. They forced to meet each other in 1966 when Stevie sees uh, Lindsay playing up in San Francisco. And she starts collaborating him with various projects, a band called Fritz, which he brings her in to actually be a lead singer. Fritz breaks up and they move down to Los Angeles to try to garner a career as a duo. And 
you know, I just absolutely love it because Stevie Nicks is waiting tables to try to support them. And they eventually do get a recording deal on Polydor in 1973. And the record is called Buckingham Nicks, very original. And it has the song Frozen Love on it. That's the, that's the title, the first single. And unfortunately, the single really doesn't go anywhere. The record really doesn't go anywhere. There's Stevie is still waiting tables. And Lindsay happens to be in a recording studio in Sound City. And uh, it's the same recording studio that Mick Fleetwood is also in. And Mick Fleetwood hears Frozen Love and really likes it. Now, mind you, we've already gone through six guitarists at this point. And so Mick Fleetwood needs another guitarist if he wants to keep the dream alive of Fleetwood Mac continuing on. So he hears it, likes it, meets uh, Lindsay. And Lindsay, basically, he kind of has the power in the situation, is how historically it's been told. And so if Mick Fleetwood wants Lindsay Buckingham, he, it comes at a price, and that price is bringing Stevie Nicks into the mix. You know, a bit more, you know, people say hanging with the fairies, but she's not really. She knows exactly what she's, she's, she's doing. You know, she's just, she's an archetype of those, there were a certain sort of women in the 70s you know, who'd always, you know, their handbags would always have kind of, you know, a packet of tarot cards, you know, maybe a couple of bones, you know, <laughs> perhaps some cigarette papers. She's like one of those chicks, there were lots of those, basically. But she's a very particular version of it because she's very pretty. Uh, she's a great artist. On stage, she's, she, she really becomes a focal point for what Fleetwood Mac become. And she's quite a diminutive figure. She's quite short, Stevie Nicks is. And so she wanted... When she first started being on stage and being really in the, you know, fronting the band the way she does, she wanted to have a visual impact for someone that was sitting further away. And that's where the, the styling started to come from. And if you look at that, it's, again, if we're looking at the idea of the counterculture being put into the mainstream culture, you have a lot of those kind of hippie elements with the shawls and like when she holds, I think like a veil, I think she, a lot of times, and just her whole kind of black magic look definitely has those hippie elements to it and influences. So again, it's bringing that into the mainstream culture in a way that I don't think any other figure did before her. Their first venture together resulted in the eponymous album Fleetwood Mac, featuring hit singles Over My Head, Say You Love Me, and Stevie Nicks, Rhiannon. It was a slow hit for the band, giving them their first US number one and selling over 5 million copies, setting a record for the longest time between an album's release and its topping the charts. The self-titled record, I think, is such an important record because it shows the possibility of what this band can do. And again, we're so deep into putting out records with the, the original Fleetwood Mac, the, you know, again, the rhythm section holding it all together. We're so deep into Fleetwood Mac as a band, even though it has rotating members, the fact they can come out in this new formation and have a number one song with Rhiannon, which is still, I think, one of the best songs ever written, period. Beautiful, cascading vocals, catchy, everything about it. It shows the possibility for them making another commercial record. And that record is so important for that. At this for a long time uh, with this Fleetwood group, Mac. Yeah. With Fleetwood Mac, what changes have you noticed, or how would you express the changes in your music through the years? Uh, well, basically, it depends on people that obviously that listen to the band. The change really that has come in recently came in on Chris V, John V, and myself, which basically has been the basis of the band for about five years at any rate and then prior to that myself and John were the rhythm section John plays bass I play the drums and the changes are are purely writers that come into the band like Stevie and Lindsay both write and members that have since passed on as it were out of the band were writers and there is definitely a strain of Fleetwood Mac through the whole thing although there's been a lot of different styles of music, it really depends on uh, the listener rather than the people in the band to relate to how they feel about the changes. How do you feel that your addition to the band has changed what they were doing, and how has it changed what you were doing? Oh, it's changed what I was doing a lot. Um, 
Well, just as a writer, you know, sure, I'm going to touch them with, with my songs, you know. Um, is it a collaborative effort when you put a song together? How much input does a writer have with the way it's going to sound on the record? For me, it's very collaborative because I I play guitar and I play piano, but I, I'm not a virtuoso either. So I just sort of write a song very, very simply, and then I just sort of have to say here, because I can't go out and you know, put all the great sounding parts on it because I just don't have the knowledge to do it. So I have to pretty much, you know, give it to them and say, do with it what you may, you know. And then I'm always there going, well, I'm not sure I like that way of doing it. But at the same time, on this particular album that's just gone by, everything they did on all my songs was, I couldn't have done them. If I had the knowledge to do them, I wouldn't have done them better, I don't think. How about the hit single? There, all of a sudden, there's a hit single that takes off. Yeah. When you're putting it together, do you... Can you sense something about it that makes it different? No, in actual fact, that was, as a track on the album, was not one of, was not considered. Obviously, when you made an album, you say, well, that, that, and that would probably be in order of preference to be the obvious single. And that one wasn't the one until it just crept up where it started being played a hell of a lot. And then it occurred to us that, in actual fact, because of that, we should uh, make it the single, which we did. In other words, you, you were... Uh in this instance, at least, waited for public taste to Absolutely. say what it was. It was purely down to that. It was creeping up behind everything else and was always there. And because no one had thought of it, it was a, a more healthy thing to do to release that. And I think it's, it's a sort of record that's not going to instantly be there, but it, it's creeping in and it's doing really well, which is a, always the best way to get a hit record, something that stays there for a long time and doesn't... Uh, very obvious hit records sometimes bore an audience after a couple of months being played on the radio. People can't stand it, you know, which I don't think would be the case with this particular record. Do you think it uh, signals a new direction musically, the, or is it just a No, I think it's just really fortunate. You know, we're really happy about it. There's no... The only difference would be, sure, you now know that you, you are, you've got a hit record, and that's it, and you hope you have a load more. It definitely gives uh, people the chance at any rate, which is always the way of, oh well, they ha they're not going to have another hit, or this one isn't as good as that. But that always happens, whatever you do. You know, even if you're playing the local village hop, you know, and you play down the road in a big ball, and people say, oh well, not as good as they used to be. It, it just gives people and critics more apparent things to like or not to like, you know, which is part of what we do, and you accept that. How about touring? How do you feel about uh, touring? You've been on a long tour. A very, very long tour. The long, in fact, it's the longest really I've ever May done. May 10th. We had a month off in Hawaii, but we have not yeah. really had any time off. A couple of days in LA here and there, you know. How does that really... uh, work with the band? Mm -hmm. How does that <laughs> affect uh, hey? everything? <laughs> it well, I mean, for obvious things. I mean, people get tired, and you tend not to have or allow yourself the time to, to do things that you'd like to do, because you literally have to pace yourself through the day. You're traveling, and like today, last few nights, for whatever reasons, a few of us haven't had the right amount of sleep. So you, you really seriously have to say, well, you don't talk too much. You don't let yourself think too much until the last couple of hours in the evening where you, you pull yourself together, which is something you get used to. Although looking seemingly relaxed in the public eye with their newly attained commercial fame, tension between the band members had been growing. They've quickly recorded the Fleetwood Mac album, and then they go out and work it for six months at least on the American road, and it gradually gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this record, you know, and, and singles come off it. And, um, you know, by the end of 1976, but, you know, the, the, the record sold four million copies and they've really, their lives have been utterly transformed. But I don't think, you know, the dramas that were happening, the soap opera of their lives, was it before they get the success, you know? 
when this, when they're still, you know, you know, as, as, as Stevie Nick said, you know, they, she's kind of surprised they go on the road and Christine McVeigh's in the back of the van sleeping on the amps, on top of the amps, you know what I mean? They're kind of still, it's, you know, it's not a kind of limos and, you know, you know, carry me to my suite at that stage. It's, it's kind of still pretty rootsy. It's not very much different to what Christine McVeigh would have been doing with Chicken Shack going up and down the motorways in England, you know? They're, they're kind of at that stage. But that's when their relationships are falling to bits. The band felt pressured to release a successful follow-up album. But fueled by a hefty amount of drugs and alcohol, coupled with their newly found wealth, led to conflict and stress between the musicians. First we have uh, Lindsay and Stevie. They're breaking up after a very long relationship. We have Stevie eventually start secretly dating Mick Fleetwood. We have Christine McVie and John McVie breaking up and Christine McVie starts dating the lighting guy and she writes, you make loving fun uh, about that relationship. Uh, Lindsay Buckingham brings the lyrics for Go Your Own Way to a practice and Stevie's reading the lyrics going, oh my God, this is, this is about me. And she has to go up on stage every night and perform that. I mean, again, getting goosebumps talking about it. I can't even imagine what that must be like. And then her kind of rebuttal, if you would, is dream. Having to not just see your ex, but perform with them, live with them on the road, be with them 24 seven and, and be of an interest to like, not just the media in the United States, but worldwide, because Fleetwood Mac by this point is a phenomena. In 1977, rumors rose to critical acclaim, featuring the hit single, Go Your Own Way eventually becoming the eighth best-selling album of all time and had topped the UK album chart for 443. Like you don't say party like a mime, you say party like a rock star. And I think it comes... The next venture came in the form of Tusk, Fleetwood Mac's 12th album, their most expensive and experimental work to date. When we were on the road, we used to do sound checks up on stage, you know, before the audience would come in and it was basically a jam, a jam thing we did on ev every concert during that tour. Lindsay started doing this riff. Da, 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 da. So that's how the actual song was started. The idea was, which everyone thought really was pretty off the wall, was to record it in Dodger Stadium. I don't know why I thought of doing that, but... France, um, up in Normandy, there, there was a, a marching band that, that came out at weekends and would march around the town. And the idea then I, I'd had was to use a, a marching band uh, on a future track so that you could actually do that live, although we only did it live with, in Los Angeles. I was hoping to be able to play one song and have the local marching band out of every town all over the world come out because it would be a, a really good warm feeling for the, the town and it would be a good rapport for the audience to know their local band was playing. That in actual fact didn't happen, but that was my plan. Mirage, released in 1982, reached number one in the US, becoming a certified double platinum record in the process. But drug addiction issues surrounding the band resurfaced, forcing Fleetwood Mac to take a hiatus. Nix was admitted to rehab, while McVie suffered some drug-related seizures, and Fleetwood declares bankruptcy. But Buckingham was unhappy to accept Mirage as their last album. Could they bounce back and release a follow-up? After Mirage, you have Stevie Nicks has said that she thinks she did $1 million worth of cocaine over the, the time period that she was addicted to it, which I think she eventually kicks in 1986. But that also got her into a different set of problems because the drugs that were prescribed to her, she then became addicted to it. She felt far worse than cocaine. <laughs> Stevie? Jim Wright, Channel 4 News. How are you doing? 
I'm fine. How are you? Oh, excellent. I think I met you uh, three years ago when you first played Dallas. I talked to you and Mick at the Fairmont Hotel. Was I wearing my glasses? Uh, no, you're wearing a nice hat, though. If oh. I correctly. Can you tell us uh, a little about why you chose to tour again while you're rehearsing for a new album? Because we love to play, mostly. We just got itchy. Everybody just wanted to go. So we said, let's go. Well, you're, you're tired of uh, rehearsing, you mean? It's not the same, you know, it's not the same to not play for people. You need to do it. I mean, periodically, you need to go out and play. It's real important. Otherwise, you forget that there's an audience out there. You just become a recording band. Yeah, the uh, Rolling Stones recently did an innovative concert tour where they played some stadiums, some uh, medium-sized halls, and some really small halls. Do you anticipate Fleetwood Mac might ever go back to playing small halls just for the experience of it? Sure. Fleetwood Mac likes to play anywhere. I mean, it doesn't really matter where we play. How's the group getting along these days? Fine. It seems to be the rock in my life. Seems to be the what? The rock in my life. You're not caught between a rock and a hard place anymore, are you? No, no, no. It's just strong. It just stands very strong. Yeah, a couple of years ago, it seemed like when, when you first joined the group, there was a lot of gossip. And now we don't hear too much about the gossip. People are talking about the music. You, you find out a relief, but what is your reaction to the change? Well, I think that people realize now that if we could come through that, we could come through anything. I mean, we realize that we could come through anything, you know. And sadly, it seems to hurt us, so the band's strong. Tango in the Night in 1987 was the final studio album by the Rumors lineup of Fleetwood Mac, containing hit singles, Everywhere, and Big Love. There were already so many records in, and if you look at kind of where music was out at that second, the fact that they even had as much success as they did with that record, again, I think is, it shows how great the songwriting is on that, because there really wasn't many classic rock bands. You know, you look at MTV at the time, videos from Tango in the Night, were being played, who else from like their contemporaries from the 70s were being played on MTV? How many of their contemporaries had teenagers uh, singing their songs, buying their records? I mean, what an achievement that is to be able to cross over with that record into that youth marketplace, which they were able to do. Stevie would probably have been at her worst, at, you know, the tango in the night period, I think. Because she's completely, you know, she's you know, she's got several sets of pressures on her, not just being one of the things with Fleetwood Mac. She's really a big solo star by then. So I think that would have kind of been, yeah, that, that would really, she would have imploded on that, really. Falling. That they had gone on to make that record in the first place. But that's part of what's so fascinating about Fleetwood Mac. Like, why do you keep coming back together, even though, it's, it's so hard, like, it must be so hard to make those records and sit and create something with each other. Well, I love you. I will. Oh. From Buckingham's distinctive sound, Fleetwood Mac recorded the album Behind the Mask in 1990. To me, Rumors is like the quintessential record where everything else that comes after it regardless of what genre is built from the Rumors record. Again, and to have Lindsay not there is to take away that tension between him and Stevie that you want to see when you go see them perform and you want to hear when you listen to their songs. And they come as a, as a package with all that history behind them that you know as a fan when you are engaging with their music. And so for him not to be there, I think... Following the tour, it was revealed that McVie and Nix would not go on the road again with the band. Not even a year later, Nix had parted ways. The, the Fleetwood Mac um, entity, I think, is something that we've, we've all come to terms with, that we can do things outside of the band without the band disintegrating and, and stopping, because we've already done that. We realize that, uh, again, a lot of people think, you know, because people go off and do different things, that there will be no more band. I think we've uh, come to terms with that within ourselves, and people realize that 
the continuous momentum of Fleetwood Mac may not be as feverish as it certainly was for seven, seven solid years. Um, and I think it's just something that we know we can come back to as people, as musicians. Fleetwood Mac fans would rejoice once more. Two years after dissolving, the band announces they are back working together in the form of Buckingham, Nix, Fleetwood, and the McVees. When it was announced that they were getting back together, it wasn't just Fleetwood Mac fans, but I think because they become by that point so important in so many people's lives, it would mean it may not have just been people that had the records. The people that by this time the songs were played often on the radio, they were incorporated into commercials. So it was a much bigger ripple than just the hardcore fans that were excited about this idea of them being back together. 1998 saw Fleetwood Mac inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Soon after, Christine McVie declares she is departing the band, leaving Buckingham and Nix to cover lead vocals on the 2000. There's something about the idea of Fleetwood Mac that I've just always liked, you know, from the moment I saw them. And it just heartens me that they've kept going. And, you know, you know as, said, as I said, I saw that O2 show, you know, where Christine came back on the encores. I thought the shows were fantastic. I mean, I was surprised almost. I thought they were still great. Then they, but they really were, you know. And Lin, Lindsay Buckingham, I did note, took a lot of the lead there. <laughs> So I don't know what they're going to do now. Fleetwood Mac are most known for, best known for, is not just the songs that we all have known pretty much our whole lives and have been there for us, but also all the other things that go along with it, whether it's the drugs, the decadence, the relationship breakdowns, all those things add layers of authenticity that anyone can relate to, whether you are a rock star, or you are a rock climber, or you're doing anything. Like it just, those are, those are ideas that everybody deals with. And I think that is what they're most well known for. Not just writing the songs, but actually meaning what they're writing. And that's an important thing about the band. Despite hitting many obstacles, coupled with constantly altering the lineup and sound of Fleetwood Mac since their conception as a blues band, they continued to prove their worth over five decades and 17 studio albums, rightfully earning their place among the greatest bands of all time.